the advice the countries like the United States and the South Korea and Japan and the European countries, they took over all the, we know the benefits and the profits. China is just a factory. It will never be a power, a strong power, and it will not be a threat to any the hegemony or <coughs> another challenge for the hegemony or to the other advanced countries. So I, want, I just want to, this uh, lecture and uh, Professor Pang's comments made me again to uh, memorize this lecture. <coughs> My short question is for uh, Professor Charles. And um, I, I, I have I joined the Professor Charles the lecture many times. And um, he always likes to uh, describe the relationship in China and North Korea into one body, or like the leaves and cheese. Uh, that also um, makes me uh, memorize the 1962s, the Cuba uh, Missile Crisis. We know the President uh, Kennedy uh, used its strong will and uh, the and the United States the force to forbid the Soviet Union to backward to uh, withdraw its missile uh, in the in the, in the, in the international missile. And we know today, the Cuba is still independent. And we, we don't think that Cuba is uh, the United States a lot that the, the lots that lives and the United States will fare cold. <laughs> um, so what I want to say is I once talked to this um, Kim Tai Wu. Uh, Charles knows that guy. Uh, he, uh, he is from the South Korea and he's uh, I guess, I, I'd say he's a doctor as Charles uh, assistant. He uh, taught me the South Korea's uh, people, they are still uh, hoping to realize the unification of the two Korea. So I want to ask Charles, how do you, oh, oh, what's your idea about the reunification of the two Korea and what's this prospect and uh, what's the implications for China and the United States? Thank you very much. Answer any of these questions, or should we wait? <coughs> let, let me just actually bring together several of these questions into one answer, which is what my view is that at the moment, China is very much in favor of the status quo. It is really the, the most status quo, stability-oriented great country in the world. They, you can see that in their economic policy. You can see that in their foreign policy. Uh, whatever, as President says, the civil society or intellectuals would say, the Chinese government seems to resist any kind of fundamental and certainly any kind of radical change, and that includes in uh, in uh, North Korea. And I think there are some positive elements as to why China pretty much goes along with whatever North Korea tells it to. But I think that on the negative side, it seems to me, China is more afraid of instability in Korea than anything else. Uh, and keeping North Korea stable is more important than stopping its nuclear program. It's more important than promoting unification. Um, and for the moment, it means supporting a divided Korea. Because I think China also fears a Korean Peninsula unified under too much of a pro-US government, a, a, a Korean Peninsula that looks like South Korea today. Now, maybe that fear is unfounded. Maybe that actually would be good for China. But my understanding of the way the Chinese government approaches the Korean Peninsula is that it's better to keep the status quo than the possibility of unexpected things happening if there is instability in the North. And certainly, if North Korea collapses or the regime disappears, that could have consequences that China might see as quite negative. Uh, thank you, Professor Armstrong. I'm a, a doctoral student in Beijing University. I have two questions. And the first one is, I have communicated with so many China's international studies scholars. They have a very different views from the government policy. They think, compared to the American's concerns with the uh, <coughs> concern with the not DPRK's nuclear public liberation, uh, and uh, they think that China was the most must to be scared because we all know so many of the, uh, most of the new DPRK's long distance missile test was just failed and they have no 
capacity to just uh, to transport the nuclear missile to the United States or even to Japan, but uh, we all know its nuclear test uh, base was very near China's borders. So many of us think that we must take the Chinese government's North Korean policy with wrong directions. We should not just uh, take a very important uh, mediate part between the North Korea and the United States. <coughs> Instead, we should focus the more detention, more attention to the North Korea to make sure to abandon their nuclear programs that make sure the China's security. And this is the first question. And the second one, second one is you mentioned the famous patterns between the Pindan and between the Peking and Moscow. And I want to know what's the pattern or what are the patterns? Is there just a maintain a long history friendship between the two countries or just uh, tricking the, each other for the, some financial support? That's a question. Thank you. Uh, well, the second question, I think, is simply the pattern of North Korea trying to extract what it can, to gain what it can, uh, particularly materially from both sides. And uh, they've been rather successful. And this relates to the first question as well. Even if China decided, and what is China, say the Chinese uh, government decided that it would put more pressure on North Korea to change its behavior, to drop its nuclear program, as the U.S. thinks it can, could it really do that? Even when there were 1.3 million Chinese soldiers in North Korea, they did not control North Korea. Even when North Korea was completely destroyed by the war, they were not under the control of uh, uh, another country. You have, cannot underestimate North Korea's remarkable ability to get its way um, in, in relationship to the, to the greater powers. So uh, I'm not sure what China could really do. Uh, if China stopped all economic assistance to North Korea, maybe the North Korean regime would do something different, but then maybe they would fall apart. And that is also seen as a threat. China. So actually, China appears to be very strong, but it is in, in relationship to North Korea. But actually, in some ways, North Korea is stronger because of its ability to to threaten even its own collapse. Yeah, sorry for my interruption. So many Chinese scholars they think the Chinese are very strong elephant was hijacked by the very small and the North Korea. What do you think about it? Well, hijacked is a very strong word. Um, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to imagine what can really be done, uh, that, what, what leverage China really has uh, over, over North Korea, even if it wanted to take some drastic steps. And I, I don't think it wants to. I think, as I said, China is a very cautious, uh, status quo-oriented country, which I, I think is not well understood in the United States and where, where many people think China is very exp expansionist and and aggressive. I don't think that's the case. I think China is actually very cautious and, and fearful and sees itself as really not being a great power even today. Thank you. Third question. Do we have a third question? Okay, please. Hi, uh, thank you all for uh, the wonderful lecture. I just have one question. Um, how does the Korean, uh, North Korean citizens view North Korea's relationship with China? Is it different from the government's uh, official views, or is it you know, along the same channels? I'm glad you asked that, because this acts, that actually gets us back to President Hunt's question about internal legitimacy. I mean, that's very <coughs> difficult to determine. I cannot conduct any in-depth interviews with ordinary North Korean citizens or take uh, public opinion surveys. But my sense is that even talking to the kind of officials that we, we meet in North Korea is that there is a concern about too much Chinese influence, especially on the economic side. North Korea has tended to favor a situation where it has competing great powers that it can play off against each other. And in a certain way, it has tried to do that between the United States and China and take advantage of US-Chinese rivalry. Uh, I'll tell you a story, speaking of evidence. Um, there was a high-level North Korean official who met with uh, Henry Kissinger a couple of years ago, uh, who said to him, uh, Dr. Kissinger, we really like your ideas of real politique. And given the situation in, in Asia, don't you think it would make sense for North Korea 
and the United States to become close, uh, al closely aligned together against the rising hegemonic power in China. Wow. And in Asia, that is to say China. Now, of course, it's very unlikely that North Korea and the United States are going to become allies against China. But I think that reflects the way that the North Korean leadership thinks. They do not want to become overly dependent on, on any country. <coughs> what do ordinary North Koreans think of, of China? Well, North, ordinary North Koreans have very little contact with any foreigners of any kind, and uh, they probably don't like them. Um, I think that's, that's fair to say. Korea has been a very you know, self-enclosed society for much of its history. Uh, South Korea is very different, but North Korea has, in a way, continued that pattern. And on the whole, they probably are not very fond of any kind of foreigners uh, in their country. And they would rather not have the Chinese have any leverage over them. As far as kind of concrete evidence, I think one thing from what I understand is that the North Koreans are trying to take more control over their economic resources. What I was told, that I have not been able to confirm this, is that Several years ago, Chinese companies were di directly taking the goods out of the North Korean mines. But that has stopped recently, and the North Korean interests are actually doing the extraction and selling it to the Chinese. So there is some attempt to take control over its economy. And whereas everybody seems to become dependent on China economically these days, uh, I think North Korea is a, a country which in particular tries to avoid that economic dependency on anyone. Uh, keep in mind that we're talking about a country with a very, very small economy. This is a very poor country. So it's, you can't really compare it to South Korea. It's, the North Korean GNP is maybe 1%, 1 percent, 1 one-hundredth the size of South Korea. Uh, so even if China completely supported North Korea's economy, it actually would not be a huge sacrifice. And I think that it's, the Chinese side thinks that support is worth the benefits. Please. Uh, in the example, you mentioned a uh, concept, uh, middle power. But, uh, in my point of view, uh, from the perspective of economic, uh, as you mentioned, uh, South North Korea may be below a uh, middle power, maybe a small power, a weak power. Mm -hmm. From the perspective of military, they may be uh, uh, it may be a uh, middle power, uh, but uh, from the first perspective of soft power, maybe they are a uh, big power because you uh, you have just mentioned that they can manipulate uh, a lot of uh, big powers. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just wonder uh, why they can manipulate so many big powers. Is that because uh, Mr. Kim Jong Two uh, doesn't you? look smart or clever. <laughs> so, what's the source of North Korea's soft power? I would not describe North Korea's power as soft, <laughs> uh, but it has to do with an ability to, especially, play upon the fears of great power. And I think that is, uh, there are a few countries perhaps in the world and in history that have been able to do that, but none as well as uh, the North Koreans. The South Korea actually had some success with this vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Uh, Sigmund Rhee, for example, the first president of South Korea, uh, was very good at manipulating the United States. Basically, he would, he would threaten to attack North Korea unless uh, the US gave, gave him what they wanted. And, he was uh, the best South Korean leader that they've ever had in terms of this ability to use threats um, against much stronger countries. And I think that's uh, the threats that get to the heart of what these great powers fear. Uh, and China, as I said, has a lot of fears when it comes to what might happen if it did not support North Korea. So that's largely negative. Power. I think there is a positive power when it comes to relations with China, which should not be underestimated. I think there is a shared history. I think there are, uh, on both sides, remnants 
of this, this revolutionary shared past that, that still have some influence, despite the, the critical intellectuals today. But I think what North Korea does more, better than anyone else is play upon the fears and the insecurities of much more powerful countries to get what it wants. And it has always done that from the very beginning. Because I think I'm, I'm too short. <laughs> uh, because I am a under, an undergraduate student, so my question is a real puzzle for me. Um, in fact, I want to want to uh, ask what brings the relationship between China and North Korea so special. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if we think it is because of the history, uh, you also mentioned that China is is so big country. He has so many neighbors. And uh, all these neighbors so have very uh, the the history like North Korea and China. So why doesn't China has the same relationship with other countries? And if we think uh, think of uh, maybe it is because of the economy. And I, I don't have have some statistic or as a evidence to show whether it is mm, much bigger than others. You also mentioned in the lecture that we are the view <coughs> is the very very poor country. So I think the economy one may be also uh, a very limited factor. So maybe maybe it is a country we can trust. And you also mentioned in your lecture that in the Cold War the North Korea plays off between the plays off China and USSR. So I think Maybe, yeah, maybe not because of it. So still, what brings that so special? I think all of those things make it special. I think the relationship is really quite unique. The country that perhaps is the best comparison on China's border is Vietnam. But the, even the long-term history of the relationship between China and Vietnam is quite different. It tended to be one of much more conflict. Uh, and. Uh, after the Socialist Revolution in Vietnam, initially uh, there was a great deal of Chinese support, but after the unification of Vietnam, there was conflict, even even a small-scale war. Uh, but the relationship with Korea has has always been different. I mean, Korea for centuries has been a very important buffer, a very important strategic country with, for China. But I don't think that any single any one explanation explains everything. I think it is really this combination of factors and ultimately the fact that China does not seem to see any realistic alternative. Uh, so it is being drawn along uh, as it goes. Um, what, I just heard a, 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 an, an expression, where does it come from, um, that the uh, first step is free, but the second step, we are a slave to it. In other words, once you begin this going a certain way, it's very difficult to change the path. And I think that's what, ha what has happened in the relationship with the DPRK. Uh, and I also think, finally, that the relationship with the United States uh, has been an important factor. Uh, there's still a certain distrust between China and the United States. And in that regard, having some uh, ties to North Korea, uh, having North Korea there as a kind of card to play against the US has perhaps played a role in uh, what China has done. And uh, luckily, I got my um, you know internship uh, in Xinhua News Agency. Uh, according to my own um, focus on uh, Eastern Asia, uh, Asia, uh, I'd like to ask some questions about nuclear crisis in DPRK and uh, Six Party talks. So uh, my first question is. Um, uh, Professor Armstrong, what do you think about the six, uh, six, six party talks? Um, do you think it is, um, you know, the best way to solve nuclear crisis in DPRK? And, uh, uh, you know, in China, some scholars um, argue about this 
question, and I want to know uh, American, uh, uh, you know, scholars' opinion about the question. And the, the next one is, um, uh, we had uh, actually a debate on um, on the um, because uh, uh, there is a theory that American wants the want China to be the leading role in the six party six party talks. So how about things um, this change? So is 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 it really um, possible uh, to let China be the leading role in six party talks? Um, thank you. That's all. How much time do we have? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I, we have certainly most. Okay. Uh, Next cool. I I very much admire all of these students for being here on a Sunday night. I, I could never get my students to come to my lecture on a Sunday night, <laughs> and, and certainly not to stay for such a long time. I should say that number one, to answer your questions or to not answer your question. Uh, number one, I'm a historian. I'm not an expert in contemporary international affairs. And number two, I have no connection to the U.S. government. And certainly, <laughs> I have no influence whatsoever on the decisions of the U.S. government. But in my amateur opinion, as an observer of these events over the last several years, I frankly think the six-party talks are probably not the best kind of forum for resolving these issues. Simply because the more parties you have involved in discussion, the more difficult it will be to reach an agreement. It's difficult enough to reach an agreement between two parties, much less six. Uh, it seems to me that solving the nuclear issue or sol solving the Korean issue uh, would come in stages and should be addressed at different levels. One is bilateral. I think the, the core of the problem is between the United States and North Korea. And I've always argued that what is most critical is direct talks between the U.S. and North Korea. As I said, I'm not an official in the U.S. government, uh, so I can say that, and it doesn't matter. But that is my opinion. Uh, I think that that is where it has to start. Another level is the issue of conflict and peace around the Korean Peninsula. That is to say, the unfinished nature of the Korean War, which has an armistice now almost 60 years old, but which there is no peace treaty. It seems to me it would be very important to achieve some kind of long-term and stable peace agreement. And for that, you would need, I think, four-party talks. China, the US, and North and South Korea, because those are the four main parties involved in the Korean conflict. And then over the long term, to have permanent mechanism for maintaining peace and for reconstruction and development of Northeast Asia, and especially North Korea, then you need to have the participation of Japan and Russia as a major economic power and a major supplier, a supplier of uh, uh, natural resources. So I think there are three different levels, bilateral, <coughs> party, six party, that should be taken uh, in sequence, not necessarily all at the same time. Having said that, I think talking is better than not talking, and having six party talks is a lot better than having confrontation so if the six party talks can resume, I think that would be a very good thing. So, uh, hello, Professor. And I, I want to ask you a question about the future, if we look forward to the future. Mm -hmm. that, uh, suppose that uh, the North Korea will collapse in about maybe 10 years <laughs> later. <laughs> and, and we see that China, China's strategic design for the, for the, for the country is that if we want to develop our economy and we need a uh, you know, friendly or relaxed uh, atmosphere around us. So we have two choices. One is that the country is disabled, that without that powerful, and then without the control for the United States. So if 
the North Korea collapsed, and then the South will uh, actually took over the, the North, and then they were united together. So it at least since uh, I think it at least uh, need five, 50 years to reconstruct the country. And then uh, it maybe uh, create more cooperation with, with, with the Korea country and the People's Republic of China. And then as China is not, uh, you know, the Gebajo that is so, so naive that without uh, a compromise with the United States that like German uh, united together. So China will deal with the United States to let the tree, uh, military of the United States go away maybe from the Korea. So will that be better for China to give the country 50 years enough for the China to for the peaceful rise? Will that be better? <laughs> yes, it could be better. Of course, I am again a historian and my job is not to see the future. <laughs> Even predicting the past becomes difficult. I won't go through your scenario and I will not say whether or not North Korea will collapse in the next 10 years. Of course it's possible. All I will say is that governments do not tend to think, except maybe for the North Korean government, in terms of 50 year scenarios. I don't think anybody in China or South Korea or the United States is really thinking in such long term. Governments think in much shorter time frame. And I think that is part of the problem. I think that there has not been really this kind of long term planning to see what would happen. But even if it is true what you say, and overall, uh, you know, 50 years from now, you have a peaceful, unified Korea, which probably would be more Chinese, uh, more pro-Chinese than pro-American, and there would probably not be uh, US uh, military forces in unified Korea. In between would be a very, very difficult period of instability, of reconstruction, and uh, simply absorbing North Korea into the South would be much, much more difficult than what happened in Germany. So even if the end of all of this process, the situation is more beneficial, how to get from here to there is a very big problem and can involve factors that we cannot predict. My question is, you just said you know, the cooperation is between uh, US and the DPRK, but I think the cooperation is on the China side. Because if you look, in, look, if you look at the history, you will find that China just regard uh, like, uh, Korea as a button zone. Uh, in the Asian China, uh, in the Asian times, China had in Korea defeat Japan, and uh, about 60 years, Years ago, China had North Korea in the United States, and right uh, and now China, China, the the act of the Korea caused so much, uh, uh, so much uh, uh, upset in, in the Asia. I think the problem is China cannot give the Korea strong support like uh, security guarantee or give give uh, give it. Uh, Nuclear umbrella. If China do so, I think the problem will be solved. But the price for China is, is very um, cost. Cost. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to hear your uh, your opinion, Michael. Well, yes, of course, it's a very high cost for China. But when I say the core problem is the U.S. and North Korea, I mean in reference to the nuclear issue. It is primarily the United States that is concerned about the North Korean nuclear issue. Of course, China is also concerned about it. Uh, and, and South Korea and Japan. But to resolve the nuclear issue, I think, have to first and foremost come from agreement between the US and North Korea, which would involve others as well, but the, the initial steps would be between the two. Uh, and many of the US would agree with you that the problem is that China gives North Korea too much support, and I cannot answer that. Uh, but what I do, sense from reading history. The conclusion I come away with is that when it comes to a relationship that has lasted for so long as that between China and Korea, these ways of thinking, these mentalities are very difficult to change. And I think it is very hard for the Chinese 
leadership to think in, of Korea uh, uh, as in any way other than kind of buffer, uh, and to have great anxiety about losing that buffer, not only in the past several centuries ago, but the, the rationale for joining the Korean War was that the U.S. and the U.N. forces were coming to the Chinese border. So that was a, a, another reason for China to come to Korea's rescue. Again, these problems have to be solved at different levels. Paul Kruger, John Jackson from Next University of China. And I have a question for both Professor Armstrong and Professor Han. Is that I think Professor Armstrong has just raised the point that China actually put the priority of the stability of North Korea rather than stop it from nuclear weapons. I think there is a premise for this issue that is North Korea is likely to collapse in almost 10 years or something like that. But I have a question is that what is the true status of North Korea now? Uh, so I have a question for both Professor Han and Professor Armstrong from the sociologist side and from the history side, maybe in the just past 10 years. What is the true status of North Korea? Because most of the information about North Korea was actually from South Korea and then in imports to America, the, into the West or into China. Actually, Chinese people haven't really been to North Korea, and we have not known much about North Korea. So I want to know, and I think most of us want to know, the true status of North Korea in just maybe the last decade, something like that. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, I don't know whether I, can, I understand your question is very far. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm uh, I'm sociologist, and I I was deeply involved with the formulation of our uh, state policies during uh, the Kim Dae-jung administration. I was the um, chairman of the um, policy um, advice group, you know. so I'm quite well aware of um, how we approach or uh, how South Korea has approached to North Korean issues. Um, well, it seems to me that North Korea is quite unable to develop by their own resources today. And as far as I can see, uh, there is no clear reason uh, why North Korea abandoned nuclear project. Yeah, so, um, if they continue this project, if it is unable to resolve this issue in a way that satisfies both North Korea and the United States international community, then it may be not so easy to anticipate kind of uh, uh, new opening new relationship, you know, normalization of relationship between uh, North Korea and uh, Western world in general, particularly the uh, United States. Um, that is kind of a scenario that we can anticipate, but something might emerge if, if you know, this nuclear issue could be resolved in a more satisfactory way, but as we have seen so far, even Obama administration of the United States has turned out to be exactly the same as the Bush administration in so far as the policy toward North Korea is concerned. You know, so we don't see any difference at all. You know, so. Now, assuming that this key issue cannot be resolved in a very reasonable, satisfactory way, um, then it will be increasingly difficult for Western world to provide any kind of economic, you know, assistance, economic, whatever support, loan, whatever, you know, to North Korea, and North Korea will find ever more difficulties. And the only solution is China. Only solution is China. Okay. So uh, many uh, South Korean intellectuals and even politicians are worrying about whether or not. North Korea is becoming a kind of 
economic colony <coughs> of China. And the Professor Pang indicate that China has no intention to control North Korea in that way. Okay, I, I, I agree, and uh, I, 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 I wish it is true. Uh, but given, given the reality of emerging and continuing economic difficulty in North Korea, and also given the anticipated difficulties of resolving nuclear issue in Korean Peninsula, what kind of, what kind of option does North Korea have? Could North Korea have? in the future. That is a very serious problem. And I am wondering, so that is my actually question probably to Professor Pang. Well, okay, uh, North Korea, China is you know, increasing its influence in many respects, okay, in terms of uh, final product, in terms of invest, some kind of raw material you know, investment, something like that. Uh, but China has very strong interest in keeping Korean Peninsula stable, I mean, as uh, you know, as far as has emphasized, I fully agree with that. And in order to keep Korean Peninsula stable, okay, then somehow North Korea should be able to develop it. Anyway. Otherwise, it will face increasing difficulty, not only external but also internal eventually. You know, so they will face very serious difficulties. Then. What kind of what kind of regional vision uh, does Chinese government have concerning the future of North Korea? That is my actual question. For example, you know, in the Western world, the uh, United States carried out a kind of kind of you know Marshall Plan okay, to rebuild uh, the Western country after the Second World War. And the uh, United States has assisted South Korea in a great, you know, uh, 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 very successful. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. So now, uh, how would China go on to deal, deal, to deal with North Korea, particularly in economic respect? Do they or will China provide rather very uh, uh, kind of very expensive, very uh, kind of uh, uh, enormous kind of uh, economic problem of uh, building uh, North Korean economy because China seems to be the only <coughs> possible exception, you know, so, and, and that's why we can anticipate it. So uh, everything seems to be dependent upon uh, how China would see the future of Northeast Asia and also future of uh, North Korea. And uh, given the, the reality of increasing economic influences over um, the, uh, North Korea, so I'm very much curious how China see the future of North Korea. That is my actual question. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, no, that's a question. Can I? I think, yeah, yeah. Let me. Let me respond to this very interesting, very important uh, question. And uh, I think and, uh, uh, most of uh, Koreas in the South Peninsula, Southern Peninsula, uh, you know, they uh, have exaggerated China's influence uh, on the changes of the next direction of uh, DPR North Korea. This is my, my first perception. The second, uh, second, I think, you know, and, uh, uh, actually China has planned visions uh, on the future of DPRK. For example, you know, the China, uh, at least since the Asia financial crisis 12, 12 years ago, China you know, they has been pursuing the regional Economic cooperation or regional uh, economic integration, and China encouraged the, the ASEAN ASEAN Regional Forum (ARF) you know to include to accept the DPRK application. You know. Now the DPRK Foreign Minister annually joins the ASEAN Regional Forum in in, in Southeast Asia, and uh, also you know and uh, at the East Asia cooperation on East Asia. 
and other regional platforms, economic, particularly economic platform. China, China uh, actually, you know, China open, uh, op you know, the, uh, uh, opens the, to the possibility of North Korea's membership. And uh, but but you know, the, the North Korea is joining uh, uh, into the regional cooperation mechanism. You know, it's not you know up to China, but up to North Korea. This is my two brief response. Responses. Uh, I think I've also been trying to make that point that China theoretically has a lot of leverage, but in reality there's very little it can do. But the, the question of whether it has a vision or not, I don't know. I don't know if Dr. Pang knows whether the Chinese leadership has, has a vision. I just want to say one thing. The only other country with the interest and the resources to invest in developing North Korea as a counterweight to China is South Korea, as you know very well. But it doesn't appear that South Korea is going to do anything along those lines anytime soon. Um, hi, my name is Emerson. I went to Columbia University in the MPA student at Tsinghua. Uh, my question um, for Professor Armstrong um, deals with, um, in your lecture you said that it, the Chinese government may think it's in their interest to, um, to keep the status quo. Um, and my question um, revolves around between the two Koreas since the end of the war, can you gauge what the actual political will has been for reunification? Um, I often hear about reunification, but what are the people, and even the governments, what is their real political will when it comes to actually doing something about reunification? You mean in North and South Korea? Yeah, between well, the two Koreas. Of course, in North Korea, there's a lot of talk about unification, and that's a very important slogan. But I think the North Korean government is very well aware of their weak position and the unlikelihood that they could enter into a serious process of unification anytime soon unless it meant giving up their own regime, which of course they will not do. But South Korea, and Professor Han would know better about this, my feeling is that everyone has to be in favor of unification in South Korea. No one can say, I oppose unification. But the reality is, especially for younger South Koreans, they don't expect it to happen anytime soon. And they certainly don't want to have a sudden unification which would be very expensive for them. You know, they don't want to bear the economic cost, the loss, the living standards, and the social disruption, and so forth. So I think South Koreans as well, by and large, uh, uh, privately at least, prefer that things stay as they are as long as North Korea doesn't behave too recklessly and there's no real crisis. Uh, and preferably if things in North Korea got a bit better. But I don't think, by and large, South Koreans want or expect a very rapid and immediate unification. Do you think that's fair? Thank you, Professor. I'm an undergraduate student from the University of China. And uh, my question is about the six-party talk. And uh, you know, last year, there's a uh, uh, model United Nations I have participated in, and this model United Nations has a conference called the Seventh Round Six Party Talk. And I was a delegate of Russia Federation. And during this conference, both uh, our Russia Federation delegate and the Japanese delegate of Japanese uh, want to highly participate in the cooperation with the rest of the uh, four countries, which is China and South Korea and the United States and the DPRK. But in the end, in the end we find that uh, our delegate of Russia and the delegate of Japan were, igno were ignored by the rest of the four countries. <laughs> so, yes, so, so I, I was wondering whether this situation of Russia and Japanese is true in the reality and is it, uh, what, the, what is the role of Russia Federation and Japanese and Japan place in the six party talk. Thank you. It does sound like yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I think and you know Russia Russia, you mentioned Russia. 
and uh, Russia is now a re-rising power, and Russia quickly come back, you know, you know back, back. Russia is back to its far east region. <laughs> okay, um, now it's going to reclaim it back, you know, but, but Russia also back. That, that could be. As far as Japan goes, Japan is quite a, has been quite a minor player so far, and up until the time the talks were suspended, they were, as far as I understand, overwhelmingly focused on the abduction issue, which uh, other parties of the talks thought was not very helpful. But I think Japan is important for the long run. Indeed, the Japanese role was spelled out in the 2007 Six-Party Agreement, which is that Japan would help in economic development. So Japan plays a rather marginal role for now, but if there's any serious progress on opening up North Korea and, and integration of the peninsula, Japan would have to play a, a very important role. Uh, I would like to know, uh, does China has any particular interest in maintaining a uh, poor North Korea? In, in doing what? Uh, having a, no, a, a poor North Korea. Keeping up, uh, poor. Well, there, that is one interpretation. They, they, they preferred North Korea poor and weak. Um, I, I can't really say. They certainly would like to have a North Korea that's more predictable uh, in its behavior. <clears throat> I think that what the Chinese uh, at every opportunity have done is to try to convince the North Koreans to reform their economy along the Chinese lines. I mean, every time North Korean leaders come, they visit economic sites and so forth. And so far, that has not been very effective. So I don't think that China really wants to keep North Korea as poor and weak as it is now. Uh, although perhaps people would say they prefer to keep Korea divided. Incidentally, I've always been struck that China is the only country in the world, if you look at a map of the Korean Peninsula, you see two countries, <coughs> Chaojin in the north and Hangul in the south. So there's no other country in the world where you see really two Koreas on a map in that way. And I think that's very revealing, perhaps, of the way Chinese feel about the country. Well, hello, Professor. I'm from the Central University of Finance and Economics, so I'm more concerned about economics in uh, North Korea. And, and I'm interested in uh, this topic, and I want to know especially what did the DPRK uh, to help themselves to get rid of the situation of Boeing, to get, uh, to get rid, of, uh, rid of their poverty? And so so on. And I know that uh, they did a reform on their currency. They failed. Mm -hmm. And I also read from the uh, South Korea newspaper. I know that uh, they ran to island to China. Is that true? I don't know. For a hundred years, maybe they want to build a, another Hong Kong, <laughs> and they're the leading of China. So at the uh, key time of the North Korea, and I want to know if. Uh, their next generation, and uh, if their next leader will have this economic uh, economic reform, and it, uh, I want to know this. I, I, um, no, I trade and maybe business and maybe avoid wars. So I think it's very important. So I want your idea. Thank you. Well, Professor Pang might know more about this. Uh, one thing that is the case: North Korea very recently has made steps toward greater economic opening in two areas, on the uh, Yellow River near Dandong and in, in reviving the uh, Nasong area in the east. It is very difficult for them to seriously open up. I did not have a chance to describe how closed North Korea still is. There's no internet service, for example, and cell phones cannot reach the outside world. Uh, so that it it is uh, more concerned about the corrupting influences from the outside than the possibility of, of the development of the economy. You know, the security is its first priority. And under those circumstances, it's very difficult to take the steps that it needs to seriously develop uh, its economy. Uh, it has tried 
in the past 10 years a number of times to move toward more economic reform and opening and has, has pulled back each time. I will only conclude by saying, as I showed you in the image, North Korea says it will be a powerful and rich country next year. So, we will see. <laughs> I'm a student uh, from the school. I just want to ask, um, do you think uh, there are any food opportunity to make money in North Korea? <laughs> well, many Chinese seem to think so. Uh, as I saw quite a few Chinese businessmen in North Korea. Uh, so you have to ask Chinese businessmen. Um, <laughs> so South Korea, no, South Korea will, will uh, no, and, uh, 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 according to Jimmy Park's reunification policy, as I know, and uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, if unification, reunification happened, and uh, the North will be a major source, a major source of uh, South Korea's next uh, future economic growth, and uh, and. Uh, uh, the leading part uh, and uh, some uh, his uh, advisors uh, don't worry about uh, you know, the repeat of uh, uh, West Germany and uh, East Germany reunification story, and uh, <coughs> the unified uh, Germany you know, delayed on um, burdened by reunification. But because uh, the North, you know, the North, the unification will speed up the growth of the unified Korea as a, as a great power world-class power and uh, great power and uh, so my <coughs> I have a point and uh, last year uh, in, in in South Korea I attended a conference titled reunification and uh, a reintegration of the two Koreas and organized by uh, one of the Lee Park's advisory body and uh, Washington DC based CSIS sick tank and uh, you know, and uh, I find it very interesting about the reunification. And uh, uh, they said, and uh, the the German story will not repeat on the Korean Peninsula because North Korea is a current situation and will boost the future North Korea. And uh, I conclude, concluded and uh, at that conference and said, and in today's Northeast Asia. There is no small power, and uh, you know, and the only small power or small country is Mongolia. And the next lecture about Mongolia, and uh, but Mongolia uh, territorially, Mongolia is a big country, and uh, you know, and uh, only the, uh, demogra uh, uh, demographically, uh, Mongolia is a small country, and uh, so and uh, North Korea is. Uh, Big power, um, great power. You now, next year, you, you have said, and South Korea. You know, today, the, the size of South Korean economy is uh, closely, is nearly uh, the same of today's India. Please note, you know, note, you know, and the people in the world now talking about the rise of China. At the same time, also talking about the rise of India. But uh, the size of India's economy is the size of South Korea. So, you know, and uh, we have uh, seriously neglected the rise of Korea, and even the future of the unified Korea. This is my additional, sorry. That's all, I think that's a, a great way to conclude. Yes, you can make money in North Korea, not at the current stage that it's in, but perhaps sometime soon. So you, you should start looking into it now and be the first in line. <laughs>
the PhD student and uh, Mr. Buyungo and his classmates. Thank you very much. Have a good, uh, have a good night.